So now you know what redeeming the time means. Rodney gave you a, an illustration. Buying the time back. This morning, as I think about preaching the message that God laid upon my heart, it's, uh, I'm excited, I'm, I'm ready. It's a message of hope. It is a message of uh, expectation. It's a message that uh, I trust will move us forward in confidence. I titled the message Hope. Last time I preached about faith, 1 Corinthians 13, <clears throat> the last verse in the chapter says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. So uh, thinking about hope, the hope that we have, the hope that God wants us to have, is, is, uh, the ne comes next in the faith, hope, and charity. And I think sometimes we we uh, maybe don't understand what hope means when the, when the Bible talks about hope. Too many times I have taken it as something that wishful thinking. I hope it is, ne it is nice, nice weather next Thursday for whatever I want, whatever I have planned. <clears throat> it's almost like wishful thinking. But according to the Strong's, which goes back to the original language. Hope means to anticipate, usually with pleasure. It means ex expectation and it means confidence. Gives a little bit different picture. And then I was surprised even that when I looked it up in the Webster's Dictionary, of course there's like three or four different definitions but the one that fits here is to desire with expectation of attainment, to expect with confidence. So that's the definitions that we want to look at this morning and as see what scripture says about expecting to attain and being confident. You know, almost everything that we do is with expectation of reward. Even things that fall in the line of duty that we are obligated to do, we expect some return. You know, we work for pay. We do good to others because we may need help sometime. We go to the doctor because we expect to get better. We mix the ingredients because in hope of the pastries that will come out of it. In the life that we now live, we understand that there is more. We will live somewhere forever. And that's mostly what the Bible talks about. There's, there's other uh, natural illustrations that it uses the word hope as well. But when largely when the Bible talks about hope, it is talking about some future event that we are looking forward to, we expect it and we are confident in what God has said. <clears throat> Through no choice of our own, we find ourselves separated from God at the age of accountability. We then have the opportunity to choose one of two destinations. It's either eternal hellfire, and that's as simple as doing nothing, or salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. There's two destinations, two choices that we make. And by default, we face eternal separation from God, and that's when we do simply nothing about it. <clears throat> the work of Jesus Christ on the cross with the resurrection is the promise of God to all mankind that he has made a way for all who come to him through Jesus. That's the promise of God, and God cannot lie. Titus 1, 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And our scripture reading will be out of John chapter 3. Uh, some of the verses that are very familiar to us, if you turn to that. 
but in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. God has promised that he has made a way for us. Even though we are of, of a fallen nature, we are essentially separated from God, we are at odds with God, but God has made a way and he promised that he will keep his part and he cannot lie. It says he promised before the world began and I don't know, my first thought would be that it, that goes back to the even before creation, even before the fall of man, God knew all things. But he goes back a long ways. John chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's talking about him being crucified and put on that cross like the serpent was put on that stick there in the wilderness. <clears throat> says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's promise. If we believe on the son of God, we will have everlasting life. That's something that we cannot do of ourselves, but it is something that God has done for us and we accept it by faith. And it goes on and says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So the only begotten son of God the way of salvation, that's the only way that we can be right with God. And God made that available to us. It's not something that we have to drum up of our own self, but it is what God has provided. <clears throat> he that believeth on him is not condemned. But if we don't believe, believe then, then we are condemned already. God gave his son and leaves us the, the choice to believe. When we believe, it stirs within us a hope, an expectation, and, an, and a desire to attain. Our next scripture reading is in, in Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> many, of the, many of the verses that we'll turn to the, this morning will have the word hope somewhere involved. And we're not going to read all the verses that have hope in it. I think there's like 127 verses with hope in it and 131, some of the, some of the uh, verses have hope in it twice. And <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16 to 20. They're still thinking about what God has promised and that he will keep his promise. It says, for, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath of confirmation is to them an end of all strife. You know, that, that's, back in the Old Testament, when a, when a man would swear by something, he's, he swore by something that was greater than himself, but that put an end to all the dispute or the uh, questioning, put an end to all strife. That was the idea, and they understood that probably better than we do because we do not swear. And it goes on, it says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, or the unchangeableness of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
by two immutable things, which is God's counsel and his oath, or we could say his word and his will. Two immutable things, two unchangeable things, because God cannot and will not lie. <clears throat> and it goes on, it says here, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. And that, that word hope, if you look in your Bible, it's in italics. But it's referring to the hope, lay hold upon the hope set before us. And the hope we have as an anchor of the soul. And what does an anchor do in a boat or in a ship? It gives stability. It, it helps so that it doesn't drift. If we would look at, I thought about reading the account of the shipwreck that Paul was on when he was heading to, toward Rome. It talks there about when they got to, well, this, they were caught up in the midst of this storm, and I may refer several times to this account because as I, th as I read the account in Acts 27 of the, sh the journey on the ship that Paul had, it is so much like the way of, of life for us. We find that there's, uh, there's times of, of calmness, there's times of, of storms, there's turbulence in our, in our life or, or in the ship, it would be waves, and sometimes we, we don't know if we're gonna survive. We, th we think we'd, we may not survive. And then there's times when, uh, like Paul had this vision that he said, the angel of God stood by me this night. And he told them the things that the angel said. And there's, it, it, give, it gave hope, not only to Paul, but to those, uh, the hundred and, uh, what was it, 176 souls that were on the ship with him. They, they hadn't ate in, uh, what was it, 14 days. It was a long time. And probably with all the, the, waves and, and such it would probably be better not to eat but they after Paul told them that every one of us will survive according to what the angel of God told me it gave them hope it doesn't say it in the Bible but it it gave them hope because it changed their whole demeanor the hope we have is an anchor of the soul What God has done for us is an anchor. It gives us stability. It gives us comfort. It keeps us from drifting out into the dangerous pearls of the sea of life. An anchor of the soul. And what God has promised, he is able also to perform. That comes out of some thoughts of, from Abraham. But God, he... Even when, when he went to sacrifice Isaac, he was about to strike him dead as a sacrifice, and God intervened. But he was also convinced of the promise that God had made to him that he would multiply his seed. And it says in Hebrews, I accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. The promise of God is an anchor for the soul. It is sure and steadfast. It gives stability even when the journey is rough. The path is steep, the waves are high, and the sky is dark. The hope of the promise is what gives us joy in the journey. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, again, scriptures that we're familiar with, he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. When we think about a yoke, taking a yoke, now there's training that, <clears throat> that <clears throat> is done with a yoke. If you think about a yoke of oxen, those, those oxen are broken, 
before they are useful. It might take the yoke to do some of the training, and Jesus is well willing and able to do that. But he is yoked with us. It's not the, uh, I, I visualize a, a picture of a yoke that is just a single, just has a single loop. Now this is a, a yoke that is a double, and Jesus goes with us. He carries our load, or helps carry our load. We have to do our part. But it is a, a yoke, an oxen, the, a, a team of oxen that are useful, are broken. And they're steady. And they're trustworthy. I have to think of, uh, of, a, of a story that, well, it takes me back to my childhood and then, then a story of, of years, years gone by where a farmer had a team of oxen for one of his workforces. We always just had the horses. But I remember in loading loose hay onto the wagon, we had the hay loader in the back where it would be clanging and making their noises and the hay would come up and dump, be dumping on the wagon. And we, of course there was work to do to get it spread out. But I remember as a little boy driving the horses and we always preferred the, the one team because they, their, um, their mouth wasn't as tough, I guess, so they were easier to hold to go a little bit slower because their, their regular pace of walk was too fast and the, uh, the workers spreading out the hay couldn't keep up. So as a little boy and holding back on this team, and I remember being glad when we got to a corner that I wasn't capable of turning the corner or when we got a load of hay because my arms felt like they were wanting to fall off. A little bit like uh, sanding, sanding drywall on the ceiling all day. But I remember the story of my dad then telling when he was a boy or younger, he remembered a neighbor that had a team of oxen. Oxen, your know, horses have to have reins and a bit to guide them. I've never worked around oxen, but from the pictures that I've seen, they use a stick just to guide the oxen and they follow the voice commands. And the, the oxen that in this account or this story from my dad was simply that they moved slow enough, said you, can't, you couldn't even hear the hay loader making its creaking noises, but it was slow enough to where nobody had to hold them back. Taking a yoke, and we are to be trained, and Jesus is willing to take that yoke with us and to be trained and train us in the way that we should go. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Sometimes it's a lifelong process for some of us. <clears throat> Take for my yoke is easy and my burden is light because he helps us is why it is easy and it is light. But he wasn't promising us an easy life and that he would, but he would, he was simply promising that he would go with us in the way. The yoke is a commitment. When I think about two oxen and a yoke, they are put there by their master by the driver, and it's not, it's a, it's a commitment. They can't get out. For us to, to take that yoke with Jesus is a commitment. You know, us yoked with him is a choice. And he yoked with us is a promise. When we think about commitment, when we think about hope and rest and peace, I have to think of a, the, the stories that, that I read some years ago, like un Uncle Tom's Cabin, a story of a slave, a Christian slave. And that slave was probably happier than, uh, than most Christians are today that are free. 
You know, the slave in the cotton field can, be, can have more rest and peace in hope than many that have freedom and are burdened under the cares of the unknown. Just because we, we don't know the future, we're just because we, the fear of tomorrow, and it takes our hope and our peace and our, our joy away. We enter hope each day because God has promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hope in the Bible is used for this life as well as eternal, and there are things today that we are assured of, we anticipate, and we have every right to expect. And Paul was assured that he could prove faithful to God in trial. There's, these, there's verses, I, I just paraphrased it, on several of these just to bring out a point that it is in this life that we, we, have, we have hope as well. I mean, it, hope for the natural things of life. Paul was assured that he could prove faithful to God in trial, that, that he would stand a test. And he writes of expecting other men's work to flourish, of others growing in understanding. That is, that is hope. That is the assurance. That is hope that is out, out, maybe out of reach, we think, but it is out there and it, it, it draws us to it. As, as Paul was writing, and as we think about hope, you know, hope isn't necessarily bold and brash and, and loud, but rather it is a quiet confidence in the goodness of God. A person without hope does not expect anything of the Lord, and James writes that that's the way it should be. Let not that man think he will receive anything of the Lord. Hope, the hope of an unbeliever is strictly limited to what he can gain in this life. But for the Christian, hope envelopes all of this life as it leads us into the life to come. We have hope in this life. Otherwise, we wouldn't live for Jesus. We have hope in the life to come in what God has prepared for us. You know, as I think about that, my mind goes again to John chapter 14 that we read this morning. In my Father's house are many mansions. We all look forward to that mansion. But one of the verses that we had this morning that if we love Jesus, if we follow his commandments, he said, he and the Father will come and make their abode with us. And that word abode is the same as mansion in the original language. We often hear about the mansion that we look forward to. But what about here and now that our abode is with Jesus and with God? I trust that is very much a part of our life. Jesus makes life worth living. If it would end at the grave, according to what uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, we would be missing the greatest part. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 19. But as we go through life, Psalm 30, 31, 14 to 16 says, But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my God. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me for thy mercy's sake. My times are in thy hand. Whatever you want, Lord, whatever will glorify you the most. Whether it, I think it was Paul again that was, was writing, whether it is by life or by death, he wants to glorify God. <clears throat> My times are in thy hand. It is that persuasion. It is that hope that spurs us on in the difficulties of life. How many times have we gone through, as we go through the day, and we have our day planned? 
and all of a sudden, everything that we planned is wrecked. My times are in thy hand. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Sometimes we, we ask, why, Lord? Why? God sees the end from the beginning, and he knows what is best for each one of us. Again, scripture reading, Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> we think about hope. A few more verses, Romans chapter 5, 1 to 5. There was a one one verse before. I didn't I didn't cut and paste that one, but I want one verse out of chapter four. Last verse of chapter four says, "Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification?" Then it goes on and says, "Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope." of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Hope maketh not ashamed, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Whatever God is doing in our hearts, whatever God is doing in our life, I trust we can rejoice, and we're not ashamed to be called a child of God. Just a couple pages back further, Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Paul starts out here with, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The sufferings of this present time. I just want to read a couple verses in uh, 2 Corinthians uh Chapter 11, the sufferings of this present times. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils of, by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and pain, painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Talk about a hope, an expectation, a vision beyond this life. Romans 8, uh, 19, it says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The earnest expectation of the creature, which is us, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. And I don't know what all that entails, but I think it has to do with when, when, God, when Jesus comes again and we, we can, manifestation is revealing or, or uncovering something so that we can see it. It says, for the creature was made subject to vanity, which that's us again, we're, we're fleeting, we're not going to be here forever in this life, but we have a life to come. It says, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Again, it's, it's probably more than what we can cover this morning in, in all the thoughts that, that are entailed in this. But the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. That is the life that we have here. Even though it is a life for God, we will be taken out of this life and into the very presence of God where, where there is no 
uh, temptation, there's no sin, there's nothing corrupt, but it is, it is the glories of heaven. <clears throat> For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. So it is talking about the, the people or the children of God. Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So that is the time when we leave this body and we are in, ushered into the presence of God. And then, then it says, now let's notice here, it says, for we are saved by hope. Now, there, there are those that use this verse to refute the idea of assurance of salvation. But when we think about hope meaning assurance, confidence, and expectation, and, and the verses prior to it, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body, we're looking forward to it. It says, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? So if we, if we use this word hope as wishful thinking, then uh, we cannot be sure that we will reach heaven. And that makes the promise, all the promises of God, that what he has provided for us, it makes it a lie. But when we... Are, we are saved by hope, by looking forward, by confidence, by expecting. You know, Jesus said at one time, he said, if any, man, if any uh, soul draw back, uh, if any man draw back, my soul will have no um, pleasure in him. We need to move forward in confidence. This hope is, is what we are looking forward to. It's like the light at the end of the tunnel. Verse 25 says, but if we hope for, for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So the hope or the confidence, the, what we are looking forward to, we don't have it yet, but we're looking forward to it. And then we with, with patience wait for it. <clears throat> when we distort this and, and make so that God is a... Essentially, we're making God a liar. He cannot lie. But when we only hope for salvation, to me, it's just simply that we're not understanding the scriptures or the power of God. <clears throat> salvation is not what man does for himself, but accepting what God has done for him. <clears throat> Another aspect of it is 1 Peter 3.15. says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. A reason of the hope. If our hope was not expectation, how can we give a reason for it? <clears throat> I don't know how you find it, but for me, we have a hard enough time testifying to unbelievers with the backing of the Bible. <clears throat> what would we, what would we say if we, if if all we could say is that well we think it's it's this is what we're doing is right and we're just hoping for the best? How many followers would we have? <clears throat> How many people could we turn to Jesus? We don't want followers ourselves. But the true, the true. Uh, uh, enlightening that God wants us to have is found in 1 John 5, 10 to 13. He said, it says there, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. <clears throat> he that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And what is the record that God gave of his Son? He said, this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You know, essentially he is, he is writing, uh, Paul said, or John said he is writing 
to show you your privileges, to lead you into this holy of holies. You know, the, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom, and we have access into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> His writing to show what believing on the Son of God means by the glorious effect it produces, it's not a blind reliance, but an actual enjoyment of salvation. It's Christ living, working, and reigning in my heart. <clears throat> and that's entering in, in within the veil, the Holy of Holies, in the very presence of God by faith. When we believe on Jesus as Savior and Lord, we have the presence of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit as witness in ourself. <clears throat> he that hath the Son of God hath life. It is hope, assurance, and we can expect him to do the things in our life that we did not foresee. Expecting him to do things in life that we did not foresee. I marvel at what God has wrought in my own heart. From where I was as a youth to where God has brought me today, it's not what I've done. It's what God has done. It is to the glory of God. We have nothing to boast about. And when we're thinking about the things that God wants to, wants to do or, or uh, things that we expect him to do in our life, he does things that we didn't expect. And we're not talking about the gift of tongues or of healing or of miracles. <clears throat> Man doesn't do those things anyway. God does. Just for one example, if you think about the, the gift of tongues, what does it say in Acts chapter 2? I think it, it lists 23 different areas of people or like 23 different languages that would have been at that time, there at that time. And they said, we hear every man in our own tongue. It's not a bunch of jibber jabber. The gift of tongues is a language. And if you have the gift of a tongue, then you will be speaking in another language, a language that is understood and a language that makes sense. And furthermore, Paul makes it clear that when, when they're speaking in tongues in a church service, there needs to be an interpreter so that all people understand what is being said. When we allow God to work in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, he will do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. <clears throat> he works a miracle in our heart. He revives that cold, stony, dead heart and gives us a heart of flesh, one that is pliable, one that is soft, and one that is, he is able to mold after his own will. And we may think we're not there yet. But there is, that's where hope comes in. We are all, as long as we are in this life, we're basically under construction. There is a process of sanctification that has been done in our lives and is continuing to do, and as long as we are in this life, it will continue. We're all under construction. We're all an unfinished art. God is still painting in our life. And Paul had the same mindset. Just a few verses in Philippians. Paul gives his, his rundown on uh, what he desires. Well, let's just read. Philippians chapter 3, 7 to 16. He said, but what things were gained to me, those I count a loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, 
that I may win Christ <clears throat> and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through, faith, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That's what he was striving for. That was his goal. That was his hope. To attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That, but then he says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Now pretty soon we'll see another verse here that would almost bring that as a contradiction. Either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but one, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark, the unfinished art. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. Now, wait a minute. Either, he said, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. But now he says, let us therefore as many as be perfect. That's not the same word in the original language. One means a complete, the completeness. The other means a, a, uh, a, a work in progress. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. That's, again, the faithfulness of God in an unfinished work. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. So even as Paul was contemplating here that he's, he's a work in progress, God was continuing to do the work in him. But he, then he writes to Timothy, he says, for I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. There again, we have the hope. It doesn't even mention hope, but it's the hope that when, when this life is over, we have a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give at that day, to all them that love his appearing. And I trust that's each one of us, where we can be, a, there's nothing wrong with being a work in progress. He's still working on me. I trust he is working in you. And if he's not, why not? That's really the question that we need to ask ourselves. If God isn't working on, on me, why isn't he? Is it because... I'm not the clay that is pliable, but I've become hardened. I've become set in my ways, but I trust that's, that's not the way we find ourselves. We want to be in the hand of God, made into an, an, uh, something that is youthful, useful, and that he can use for his glory. The hope that is set before us, let's never lose hope or ne never lose the vision of what the end of our life will be, and that's the hope that is set before us. Shall we kneel in prayer? Our Father in heaven, as we come before you again this morning, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your blessings to us. Thank you for the hope that you've shown to us again this morning, reminded us that you have prepared, you've designed for us, and you want us to look forward to because you have it's a promise that you've made to us. Help us, Lord, that we would do our part. We know that you will, you have done your part and you will keep your part. <clears throat> but help us to do ours. That we faithfully, uh, even as we looked at our Sunday school lesson this morning, that we follow your commands and that we, in this way, show that we love you and that you will come and make your abode with us. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your revealing of yourself again this morning through your word. We just pray that you would continue to work in each one of our lives through your spirit that each one of us 
in the true story, I'm not making any sense here again, so I'll leave this one for it. And the reason you can leave it, people in case you wanna take it. Just open it up for testimony, correction, whatever the Lord has laid upon your heart. 